does it matter who becomes the leader of the ANC? But this question of allyship to coloniality, I think, is at the heart, mm. really, of the critique of Ramaphosa. The ANC is an instrument of revolution. It is not the revolution. The release of Janus Wallus. There must be a preparedness to either create or grab other options. These were some of the best amongst our society mm. at a time. Now the liberation movement has become synonymous with corruption yeah. and all things venal. Spread the fire, welcome back to SMWX. And today we are honored once again to be joined by the preeminent guest on this channel, Ukoko Aubrey Machiku. Toboza Koko, thank you very much for joining us again. Toboza Kesh. We're really appreciative that you've taken the time to share your wisdom and insight with the audience once again. Toboza. Koko, can we begin? with the ANC's conference. What's your reading of the conference at the moment? Well, a lot of focus has been on whether President Cyril Ramaphosa will be re-elected for a second term. Um, the closest contender seems to be former health minister, Zulim Kize. Um, there's, there, there, there have been a lot of names bandied about and around when it comes to the position, for instance, of Secretary General, uh, the Deputy Presidency, and so on. Yeah. Um, my own take is this. It comes in the form of a question. Mm. Does it matter who becomes the leader of the ANC? Does it matter who the individuals are mm. who are going to become part of the leadership collective of the ANC? My answer is that it does not matter. It does not matter in the first place because whether it is Ramaphosa, Zulim Kize, or another who is elected ANC president in Nasrek, there are certain things about the ANC that are not going to change, that will remain the same. One of them, and for me this is one of the most critical, mm. is that the ANC will remain loyal more to the interests of global and domestic capital than they are to the interests of uh, South African citizens, particularly those who were victims of colonialism and apartheid who currently are victims of neo-apartheid. So that is not going to change. Another thing that is not going to change Notwithstanding all the talk, the ANC and uh, many of its leaders um, have been imposing on a political discourse about renewal, mm -hmm. is the fact that the ANC will remain in a state of decline at a strategic level, at a tactical level, at a moral level, at an intellectual level and other levels, the ANC will remain in that state of decline after this conference. Partly because the strategic thought that must go into this conference as to how this conference can rescue the ANC 
after the state of decline is not going to materialize. Partly because, as I said, one of the levels at which the ANC has declined is the strategic and the intellectual. Mm -hmm. What it also means is that because another level is the decline at, uh, with regard to the quality of leadership that is available to the ANC and the ANC makes available to the country. For me, the identity of the individuals who will be part of the leadership co collective of the ANC after this conference does not matter because in critical ways, the ANC will remain the same. And one of those critical ways is its conception of its historical mission. Because the ANC has, has lost too much in its conception mm -hmm. of what its historic mission is. Now, here is how I understand that historic mission. Mm -hmm. And that historic mission is incomplete and will remain incomplete for a, a long time. And I must warn you, Kathleen, that I will co go back to some of the things we have said before, you and I, mm -hmm. uh, during this conversation, including the fact that the struggle against apartheid and apartheid colonialism was a struggle to bring to the fore a society that in social, political, economic, class, race, and other ways would be antithetical to apartheid society. But once that society is put in place, the task of improving that very society that is antithetical to apartheid society for the better begins. And once that itself is, is achieved, qualitatively the struggle must begin to improve even that society that has been put in place, which means, in a way, this is going to be an ongoing task, a task that in all probability will outlive the ANC. Now, the question is whether the ANC in its current incarnation is equal to this task. My answer, unfortunately, is that it is not. And that is why what I've said to you before is that we must distinguish between the ANC and the revolution. The ANC is an instrument of revolution. It is not the revolution. And the question you must ask is whether the ANC remains an effective instrument for the advancement of the revolution or not. If the answer is no, two things or one of two things must kick in. First of all, the ANC must be transformed. Or if it cannot be transformed, it must be discarded and thrown into the dustbin of history. Now, we can do very pessimistic analyses about the ANC's um, decline and what it portends for the future of mm -hmm. the society. For me, there is nothing mysterious about the society going into a state of decline or an institution or an organization such as the ANC going into a state of decline. Societies, institutions, organizations will, at some point in their lives, go into a state of decline. And there's no mystery there. What is important is whether during the state of decline, the society, the organization, and in this case, the ANC, makes decisions, is, decisions, is able to make decisions of a quality that will rescue the society or the organization, in this case the ANC, out of that state of decline. In other words, 
is the 55th conference of the ANC going to be part of that process of making decisions of such a quality that during the state of decline, the ANC has an opportunity to enter a phase that may be regarded by history as a golden period. For me, that's the issue. And when I look at the current state of uh, the ANC, it appears to me that the ANC in its current incarnation and with regard to the quality of leadership available to it, particularly the quality of thought leadership available to it, the ANC is not in a position to rise to the occasion. When you say that, uh, two things spring to mind. One is the way that we create this battle between often two people or three people who could lead the ANC, mm. but actually how our historical experience mm. has been one of such sameness, no matter who leads the exactly. ANC. There's actually so much that remains the same, no matter who leads the ANC. Mm. And second, this worry that I have. We all have worries about South Africa. There's load shedding and there's bad service delivery and there's corruption and there's inequality. But when you talk about conquering apartheid and colonialism and those injustices which remain into the present, the the release of Janus Wallus, um, and at the time as we talk, we haven't had time to study the judgment in depth, and those are legal questions. But the symbolism of the country on its knees and those who effectively perpetrated apartheid or who perpetrated the murder of Mm. those who sought a new society mm. walking free there's something about that moment which 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 says to me the cry that we're at a new moment of the crisis where the forces of apartheid are smiling and the forces trying to defeat apartheid are, are up against mm. bigger mm. challenges than they have ever faced before mm. well <laughs> I wrote a column, when I still had a column in the business day, mm. about this matter. And I argued to Ben that if Yannis Walush met the criteria for parole, such parole should be granted to him, and immediately thereafter he should proceed to hell. <laughs> That's what I said in that mm. column. Sure. And, and in, in the column, I was doing two things. Mm. I was dealing with the narrow legalities. Sure. And in terms of the narrow legalities and how we wrote the relevant laws, it seems to me that he did meet the criteria. But when I say that after he's granted parole, he must proceed straight to hell, I'm dealing with a much broader mm. issue of the meaning of Walush. What is, what is Walush? Now, you know, even those white people who are not right wing, there is a way, direct or indirect, in which they benefited from the murder of Krisan. Remember, this was not the killing of an individual or a communist. What Wanush, Walush tried to kill is an idea. So that the idea does not mutate to become a reality. In other words, what I mentioned earlier, the idea of a new society that is antithetical in its class, race, gender, economic, and other relations yeah. to apartheid society. 
But this is what Wanyush, Wanyush tried to kill. What the conference of the ANC must decide mm. is whether it is going to be an ally to Alush. In this sense, one of the problems we face to this day is the problem of coloniality. And allied to that problem is the fact that too many of our leaders on the African continent, including this country, have become allies to coloniality. Mm. So one of the things this 55th conference of the ANC must decide is whether the ANC will continue being an ally of coloniality and therefore an ally to what someone like Walush stands for. I don't want to say much about the Constitutional Court itself. Mm. I, I think we still need to engage in conversations which problematize, firstly, the idea of a constitutional court. Mm. Secondly, the idea of constitutionalism. Because what we must remember is that things such as democracy, mm. things such as constitutionalism, things such as a country are stories. Mm. Now, Shimamanda Ngozi warns against the dangers of the single story. Now, it seems to me that when we tell the story of our democracy, we tell a single story. Um, it seems to me when we tell the story of South Africa, South Africa is a story, is a single story. Mm. And there are so many stories that are either ignored or suppressed. So there are many stories about our democracy. And some of these stories are about other democracies. In other words, as we talk about our democracy as a story, mm. we should be able to tell other democratic stories, particularly when it comes to the need to imagine and reach for alternatives to the current idea of what constitutes um, democracy. So, Janusz Walush, ironically, kills Chris Hani because those of his ilk and he himself, Chris believed that people like Chris Hani must die so that the world must remain democratic. That is one of the tragic ironies of what Walush did. And so the ANC in this conference must decide whether it is going to be an ally to Walush and those of his ilk. Mm. The person of President Ramaphosa is interesting to the extent, firstly, we, we have archived the Ramaphosa presidency in our conversations over the years now, um, mm. which I think is a fascinating archive because a lot of what we've said, people thought we were crazy. Yes. Um, and I'll leave it up to them to go back and watch those and make up their own minds. But I guess the problem with the, the Ramaphosa presidency when we, when we go deeper into it is not the person I'm sure Cyril Ramaphosa is a wonderful... It's a nice man. <laughs> mm. Wonderful, affable person. Um, I, I don't think I've ever met him, but um, the stories I hear is that he is actually a nice person. Mm. Um, but this question of allyship to coloniality, I think, is at the heart, mm. really, of the critique of Ramaphosa. Um, mm. And maybe it hasn't been articulated strongly enough, because when we look at his presidency, his life, and what it's come to represent, mm. it seems to fall on the side of the ANC, because the ANC has many currents, on the mm. side of the ANC that has been prepared to open the door to the forces of capital in South Africa, mm. of money. Mm. Not only to open the door, to actually become part. Mm. Mm. Um, to open the door to those 
global forces. And so that is really the problem. Mm -hmm. It's not that the gloss and the nice artificial things are great. Mm -hmm. The talk, tough mm -hmm. talk on, on corruption, yeah. wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, attempts to clean up however sparing and uh, rare they have been, wonderful. Mm -hmm. But when we take a step back and ask ourselves, have we advanced that goal, that mission that you talk about? Mm -hmm. We've gone backwards, haven't we, under mm -hmm. President Ramaphosa? Well, there, there are many ways in which I think about the presidency of uh, Cyril Ramaphosa. Firstly, it is uh, the author, George Orwell, who said, just because you live in a democracy does not mean you will not be subjected to authoritarianism. In my view, the Ramaphosa presidency or the Ramaphosa moment has been decidedly authoritarian. And the democratic space, aided in part by sections of our commercial media, has narrowed down considerably. Lies have become the truth. The truth has become a lie. Secondly, the new dawn moment, the Tumamina moment, mm. the Ramaphosa moment, is a non Aouse moment. In the sense that With its advent, that is the new dawn, the promise is made that the sun will rise in the west and set in the east. As was the case at the time of Nongaos, when Amakosa um, were told that um, they must kill their animals, destroy their fields, because after that, the day will come when the sun rises in the west and sets in the east. Mm. And as that happens, millions of cattle will come from the horizon, and the fields will grow again, and the land will be a place of plenty and prosperity. Now, we are doing the same here. We believe that under Ramaphosa, the sun will rise in the west and set in the east. But it is not fields, what, fields of mealies and other forms of food we are destroying. It is not our cattle that we are destroying. We are doing something similar. Instead of cattle and our fields, we have destroyed and are destroying public entities as part of this promise. Destroy SAA and other public entities. Destroy ESCOM and other public entities. When you are done, according to the new dawn, the sun will rise in the west and set in the east, and prosperity will descend upon South Africa. That is another way in which I think about the Ramaphosa moment. Another way I think of the Ramaphosa moment is in terms of how he, and the party he leads have become allies to coloniality. Hence, we can characterize what people call our post-apartheid setting as a new apartheid reality. So, during this period of uh, new apartheid, which coincides with the leadership of Cyril Ramaphosa. 
Another way in which you can speak about him as a leader of the party and the country is this. But what we have here, and, and, and here I'm going to be accused of being R.E.T. Mm. It doesn't matter anymore because uh, those who make the accusation know they are lying. But it's something they need to say to discredit what I'm saying. Mm. Welcome to the club, by the way. Yes, yes. It's, it's, a, it's a good club, R.E.T. <laughs> you find yourself on the same side as Kanye House. <laughs> um, as, as an ally of coloniality, Ramaphosa has done two things, in my view. Mm. He betrays his people and his party. But he fails those on whose behalf the betrayal happens. And this is what makes him weak. Because in the end, through the betrayal, you would have thought uh, the interests of those on whose behalf the betrayal happens would be fortified. Yes, the Ramaphosa presidency has delivered certain things to whiteness, to coloniality, uh, to global and domestic capital. But the noises I'm hearing from those on whose behalf the betrayal happens are that they are fed up with him in the belief that by now he should have done more for them and has failed. And that is why I say he betrays his party, the ANC, and his people. Um, but fails to deliver to those on whose behalf the betrayal happens. Mm. I, I would say to them they should not be too pessimistic because who knows? The next leadership of the ANC may do much better than the leadership collective Ramaphosa leads. In other words, this may be a leadership that succeeds where Ramaphosa has failed in relation to those on whose behalf the betrayal is happening. You know, that's interesting to me because when I read it through the Parapala situation, We haven't really thought through in its full depth what that moment means because it's it's almost the new dawn moment and then the pala pala moment mm. and the two they couldn't be more dissonant mm. but they are about the same person and pala pala is is actually a, it represents that double betrayal mm. because on the one hand the ANC and those who believed in the Ramaphosa moment, bless their hearts, mm. um, realized the lie. Mm. But also, capital realizes the lie. Mm. And now we sit in a situation where, on the eve of the 55th conference, we could have a report which, which says there's prima facie evidence of wrongdoing from mm. independent people and when that report comes, if it comes in that way, the ANC thinking that it rescued itself from its crisis, mm. capital thinking that it rescued itself from its crisis, mm. will realize mm. they're back in the same crises they were mm. trying to extricate themselves from. Mm. Well, which um, ratings agency may have been prophetic in this regard? Um, it may have been three months ago when they did this assessment about the potential impact of Palapa. Mm. And, and, and they argued that Ramaphosa's credibility has been dented. Um, as a result, the space within which he must move 
to adopt the right-wing policies he needs to adopt has narrowed down considerably. And then they then surmise that as a result, Ramaphosa is no longer the tool or the instrument the country can use to obviate the impact of the headwinds that are coming towards our economy. My reading of that assessment is that, at least according to Fitch, and uh, to some extent representing the sentiments of global and domestic capital, Ramaphosa is yesterday's man. It's no longer in their interests to prop him up as they've done over the decades. Because uh, his survival may not be in the interest of global and domestic capital. In other words, he has become a liability. The ANC should do the same kind of assessment about the potential impact Palapala and Ramaphosa himself may have on the party and its prospects in future, particularly with regard to the decoupling of the interests of the ANC from the interests of the people. So there is a time you can credibly talk about the people as a key motive force of the National Democratic Revolution. But even at that time, what is not sufficiently understood is that this key motive force has agency. And you may exercise that agency in ways that are detrimental to the interests of the ANC. And in the past three, four elections, what have we seen? We've seen this decoupling by the key motive force of the National Democratic Revolution, the people, of its interest from the interests of the ruling party. And in a way, that speaks eloquently to this idea that there is a need to distinguish between the ANC and the revolution, and therefore a need to have a conversation inside and outside the ANC, whether the ANC remains an effective instrument for the advancement of the interests of this key motive force, the people. And if it isn't, it must either be transformed, the ANC will say it will renew itself, failing which it must be discarded. Because the idea of reaching for a society and creating a society that is qualitatively better than what we have in this neo apartheid movement is an idea we must accept and cannot be implemented exclusively through the ANC. I think history gives us a range of options. And the ANC must be seen as one option in that range of options. And therefore, in our thinking, including members of the ANC, there must be a preparedness to either create or grab other options for the advancement of the interests of the so-called key motive force of the National Democratic Revolution, the people. So Pala Pala, um, exposes the lie about the New Dawn. Now, remember, the New Dawn is not completely a homegrown lie. It's, it's, it's a lie that is handed to Ramaphosa in part by forces external to the country and external to the ANC. Because through that lie, what must be reinforced is white control over the economy, 
And here I'm talking about global and domestic whiteness. It's white control over the land and white control over conceptions of the rule of law. This is what must be reinforced through the lie of a new dawn. And what Palapala has done is to dent the credibility, not only of the idea of the new dawn, but of the instrument of the idea, Cyril Ramaphosa, and the source of the idea. What, what worries me in that moment as, as that idea takes root is the reversal that we have seen in long-held and noble, in my view, ideas about anti-racism and the struggle for anti-racism or the struggle against racial oppression mm. in South Africa. Mm. The idea that the state should be a key player in that, in that struggle. Some of the very basic assumptions like the state's role in being an agent for racial justice are now coming under question <laughs> and are under sustained attack. Mm. Um, we saw with an organization like DISCHEM, which said at some point it was going to actively promote uh, black people in its hiring practices mm. in a way that may have been crude or, or, or whatever, but the problem wasn't the crudeness. The problem was the idea of um, consciously including black people in DISCHEM's workforce, mm. which, by the way, was almost exclusively white and male. Mm. We've seen BEE and affirmative action not as a law, but as an idea, as a principle coming mm. under sustained attack. Mm. Is it really necessary anymore? And so what we're losing in this moment is not just the baby, it's also the bathwater, mm. or vice versa, rather. Um, and that's a dangerous position in which to be, because as the economy slides, Mm. We could also lose what little gains um, were made in 1994 to this idea of efficient governmental efficiency or mm. getting rid of um, ANC attempts mm. um, to reach for a new society. That's my fear. Well, it's a well-founded fear. Can I take you back to 1990. Um, I don't know how old you were in 1990 when Nelson Mandela was released from prison. I was one. You were one. Man. Uh, I was in my 20s. I was much younger and handsome. <laughs> uh, today I'm just handsome. Um, now, at the time, I, I characterized the release of this one man from prison as the release of an idea, the idea being freedom from prison. So what walks out of Victor Fester prison is not one man, Nelson Mandela but the dreams of millions of people in South Africa and outside South Africa who yearned and continue to yearn for, for freedom. So your fear is well-founded because that man, Nelson Mandela, was not just a man. He himself was an idea, and therefore part of a big idea. And the organization to which he belonged, the ANC, was itself part of that big idea, the idea of 
freedom. And what I keep on coming back to, the creation of a society that with each succeeding epoch will be qualitatively better than what came before. That's the idea. Part of that idea is another idea that you find in many writings of the ANC, a society that is at peace with the world and is at peace with itself. The main social contradiction, some might say the main contradiction during colonialism and apartheid was that of race. Now, I'm not saying this was a perfect response, but one of the responses was that you defeat this demon of racism through the installation of a society founded on non-racialism. But that idea itself is under threat. It's under threat because of some backward tendencies within the ruling party and outside the ruling party mm. and in society as a whole. But it is also coming under threat because the idea is discredited. It is discredited because what the liberation movement stood for, and here I'm, not, I'm talking about the, the liberation movement as a collective of organizations that fought for liberation. What the liberation movement stood for has become discredited. Because now the liberation movement has become synonymous with corruption yeah. and all things venal. And therefore, the idea of liberation itself has become contaminated and has become synonymous with all things corrupt and venal. Now, it has become discredited because racism is opportunistic. The racism of whiteness is opportunistic. What whiteness sees in this moment of the idea of liberation having become synonymous with all things corrupt and vina, whiteness the racism of whiteness sees it as a confirmation of what it has always believed, that those who are not white are incapable of governing a modern state and a modern economy. Given an opportunity to do so, they will succumb to base instincts, animalistic instincts that make them corrupt, that make them loot the state and other parts of society. That's another reason why this idea of liberation has become discredited. There is a, a premier, a provincial premier, who tells the story ma many years ago. He, he, I will not name him. All I will say is that uh, he's an avid Morocco Solos support, I think he's the only remaining Morocco Solos mm. support <laughs> in the world. Yeah. <laughs> he says to us mm. that he was talking to his sons. One says to him, you know, Daddy, there's going to come a time when there is no one who will admit in public. He's a Morocco Solo's supporter. Mm. And he says, another son says, Daddy, there's going to come a time when no one is prepared to admit they were ever part of the ANC. Mm. Because the ANC is an idea, what it stood for. 
has become discredited and the opportunism of white racism does this. It says the corruption of those who fought against colonialism and apartheid is not only evidence that we were right in thinking and saying that in the end they will succumb to their true nature and succumb to base instincts such as self-aggrandizement and corruption. But also, what their corruption does is to cleanse us of the sin of apartheid. Mm. The only sin that remains is the sin of their corruption and venality. So in effect, the sin of apartheid is erased. And the sin of apartheid is replaced by white arrogance. You see white arrogance in the economy and elsewhere. Now, white racists, some of them big business people, like uh, this fat Mr. Hassel or something, they can spew racist bile with confidence because they have been cleansed of their racism by the sins of corruption of those who are in the liberation struggle. And this is, these are some of the things delegates at the conference must think about. Well, to the extent that we are there to think. Mm. I want to go deeper, Gogo, because it feels like our conversations have been pushing in the political direction and then they reach a level deeper than the political direction and I tend to pull away then. But I think we're ready to to go deeper. I think we, we've grown up now. Yeah, we've grown up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in one of our conversations you said you said that the ANC's malaise is representative not just of a political malaise but of a spiritual malaise. Now, if we're not talking about organized religion here, we're not yes. talking about we're talking about and I want to link this to corruption and what you what you say. A failure on the part of our leadership in South Africa to attain their highest selves, to submit to their lower selves. Mm -hmm. And I think the question for me is why and how did that happen? Mm -hmm. Because these, mm -hmm. these were some of the best amongst our society mm -hmm. at a time. Mm -hmm. Some of them managed to hold on to that higher self. Mm -hmm. But even the best among us when presented with all that power and all that wealth fell victim. Mm. And maybe we need to ask ourselves why. Why we, if put in that position, would mm. also fall victim. And so I suppose that's the interesting part for me is when we speak of the spiritual, you don't necessarily just speak of ethical relations mm. or mm. Um, our understanding of the divine, we also speak of an attempt to attain our highest possible self. Yes. And it seems that we are unable in this particular mode and place that we are in, in South Africa, mm. to get leaders or to become um, our highest selves. I, I believe, Kerkla, that uh, when we engage with the topic of spirituality and the imperative of reaching for our higher selves, which is an imperative that is going to outlive the death of the body as the spirit continues with this eternal life, we must do so with a sense of humility, remembering that we are not perfect ourselves, that we ourselves 
are still journeying towards that higher self. At the time of the death of this body, I may be in a more evolved place than I am today. But once that body dies, the journey continues eternally, the journey of reaching for one's higher self. Now, if I must start with the ANC before I deal with the broader spiritual mm. question you're asking. Mm. Another way in which I think of the ANC is this. The ANC emerges at a particular moment in history. Uh, before it, there were anti-colonial wars and struggles. And our ancestors lie in defeat. What they stood for, what they understood to be good, and to be a good society lies in defeat. Their conception of spirituality lies in defeat. And so on. But the death of their bodies, those who were led by Ushaga Gasenzana Kona or Sikukuni or Mushweshwe, in anti-colonial struggles. As their bodies die, their spirits begin the next phase of their eternal journey. And part of the responsibility as spirit they bear is the task of continuing with anti-colonial struggles. Located, of course, as spirit, outside the, or beyond the material realm. So, when the ANC is born, it is born at a time when our ancestors are already a spirit engaged with the next phase of anti-colonial struggles as part of their eternal journey. And therefore, what that means is that they conceive of politics as an instrument of writing that which was wronged of remembering and remembering that was that which was dismembered. And so when you think of the ANC and any other formation which is part of this struggle, you must think of the ANC and other organizations that were part of the liberation movement as them engaging in struggle in conjunction with our ancestors as spirit. So we don't engage in this struggle alone. We are with Abokok and Abomkul, who came before us, who are now spirit. Because they are spirits will never find peace until this struggle delivers the kind of society they, dream, they dreamt of and the kind of society we dream of. In other words, I'll put it in a mm. 
in part the ANC was formed, maybe they did not realize this, those who formed it, was formed so that Izogwenza Umsebez Obatara. In other words, the political and historic mission of the ANC goes with the spiritual mission of engaging jointly in struggle with our ancestors in spirit who themselves can only find peace once we succeed in installing the kind of society they dreamt of and the kind of society we dream of. So all the rubbish and the nonsense that has become part of the ANC is a betrayal to our ancestors. There are things, of course, people in the ANC, leaders and members are doing that are inconsistent with the will of our ancestors, particularly the evil practices some of them engage in. And one of those evil practices is corruption. There are others of a spiritual nature, evil practices people in the ANC engage in to win power, to win position. As a result, in spiritual terms, the ANC is a very dark place and dark space that is in need of cleansing. But what it has done, this dark space we call the ANC, is that it has contaminated the, the space in which it is located our society. As a result, our politics itself is a dark space, a place that is in need of cleansing. Therefore, the crisis in the ANC is symptomatic of a deeper crisis in our politics. In other words, this is a crisis of our political class in its entirety. Because at the moment, our political class in its entirety is part of the problem, not the solution. So part of this revolutionary task of changing the society for the better and reaching for our higher selves is about cleansing the political space and therefore the political class in its entirety. You can remove the NC tomorrow. Mm -hmm replace it with a DA or another party, you will still be left with the task of cleansing our political space mm. and cleansing our um, political class. So this 55th conference must be seen by delegates as an attempt and an opportunity to return to the joint task the ANC must perform with our ancestors to reclaim the idea of this post-apartheid society that will be free of and from the things that ail our society at the moment. And therefore, this 55th conference has both the political and spiritual dimension. And, and this is how delegates must think about this. So when you vote for a particular leader, one of the questions you ask is whether this leader is the kind of leader who will be equal to the task of promoting both dimensions of the work of the ANC, the spiritual and the political. So many things come to mind, but yes. when, when you say that, to come back to the political in a way, I wonder if something different is not necessary. Hmm. Which is not that the ANC or the delegates who go to the 55th conference should reclaim 
but whether the ANC itself needs to be sacrificed. Yeah, the idea of discarding it. Exactly. Yeah. Whether our body politic has to sacrifice the ANC in order to cleanse itself. Yeah. Um, and I suppose in spiritual traditions, the idea of sacrifice is, is embedded. Yes. Yeah. But it feels as though, on one hand, we, we want to hold on to we want to hold on to the old while yes. creating the new, and we can't we can't do that. Yeah. In order to create the new, we have to sacrifice the old, and yeah. it feels as though we're not ready yet as a as a as a people as a nation to commit to that that break and that sacrifice, if you will. Well, you're right. I mean, one of the things indigenous knowledge teaches us. Mm is the idea of constant renewal. Mm -hmm. And some of the renewal that needs to happen. <laughs> so I laugh every time I see um, a leader of the ANC talk about renewal, mm -hmm. because they seem oblivious to the fact that once you start talking renewal, you must be alive to the possibility that this renewal may have to happen through, as you say, sacrifice at two levels. Mm. Sacrificing the ANC so that our society can live. In other words, they seem oblivious to the fact that the ANC may have to die so that we can live. Mm. They are oblivious to something else as the individual leaders of the ANC. And here I'm not talking about a literal death. Mm. They seem oblivious to the fact that they must die so mm. that we can live. Mm. Now, there is what we call Imvo Magofa, literally translated, Ugofa is death. Ugvoma is to agree, so you agree to die. Mm. There's what we call Imvo Magofa. I look at this 55th conference of the ANC as an opportunity for the ANC to perform the ritual of Imvo Magofa. Hmm. The old must die so that the new can be born. The new can be born unless the old dies. And that cannot happen unless the ANC engages in a ritual of Imvo Magofa. If not the ANC itself, Certain things about the ANC must die so that the new can be born. So you are absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, last night when I was in conversation with my ancestors, and by the way, I'm not speaking on behalf of all ancestors, or even my own ancestors. Um, To the extent that I understand what they are saying, that's what I'm trying to do, to share with you what I understand them to be saying. So in discussion with them last night, I tell them that, you know, tomorrow Ufubi is coming. We're going to have this conversation. Mm. And they say to me, there's a small thing you must talk about when you talk about spirituality. Greetings. Salmon. Shalom. Namaste. Um, and other greetings. Mm. Salam alaikum. Let's take salam alaikum, peace be upon you. Mm. Shalom. Mm. Namaste. Help me again mm. with a, a precise translation of okay. namaste. Namaste, as I understand it, is I see the divinity in you. 
I see your highest self. Yeah. So born. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Namaste says, I see you, but goes further to tell you what I see in you. Mm. I see the divinity in you. Saubona. Mm. Namaste. Mm. Tawaz. Mm. Shalom. Peace. Salam alaikum. Peace be upon you. Mm. Okay? So, so when I say Tawaz, therefore, or Shalom, or Salam alaikum, what am I saying? I am wishing you harmony in not respect. I am wishing you harmony in your relationship with the source, in your relationship with what others may call God, others may call the universe. I am wishing you harmony in your relationship with the universe, universe and what lies beyond it. I'm wishing you harmony in your relationship with your ancestors. And here I'm talking about two things. Ancestors in their incarnation as those who were there before us. Mm. And their current incarnation as spirit. So I'm wishing you harmony in your relationship with your ancestors. Mm. I am wishing you harmony in your relationship with nature. Because if there is harmony in your relationship with nature, you would not visit the pain you visit upon nature, which necessitates today that we talk so much about climate change, amongst other things. I'm wishing you harmony in your relationship with others. If there is harmony in your relationship with others, things like racism do not arise. Things like sexism do not arise. Patriarchy do not, uh, patriarchy do not arise. Capitalism does not arise because capitalism is one of the most evil things the human mind has ever devised. Capitalism dis disturbs harmony, particularly harmony in your relationship with others. There can be no harmony in our relationship with others if we oppress and exploit, as capitalism does. I'm wishing you harmony in your relationship with self. Mm -hmm. Because if there's harmony in your relationship with self, the other levels of harmony I've spoken about materialize. Uh, yeah. And all that harmony is part of a broader process mm. of ensuring, well, two things. That you reach a point where you accept both your mortality and immortality. Because in accepting that, you accept that before your mortality is the task of reaching for your higher self. After your mortality comes your immortality, during which you will still continue to engage with the task of reaching for your higher self. Things like capitalism, racism, sexism, homophobia, and so on are inconsistent with that kind of harmony. Gogo, when you talk of that, that harmony, and I'm struck especially with the, the harmony with self, um, and it's linked to what we spoke about with leaders and corruption and falling mm. victim to one's base desires and not being able to surmount that or overcome that. Um, in many spiritual traditions around the world, whether we talk about Christianity, whether we talk about Islam, whether we talk about Hinduism, um, there's this tradition of 
internal reflection of uh, self meditation, self understanding. Mm. Before you try to act on the world and change society, yes, you must first go inward. And when we speak of spiritual traditions that emerge from Africa, um, I don't hear a lot of the wisdom of that dimension of spirituality, which mm. I'm sure is there. I just mm. need to educate myself more on mm. it. There's, we have a lot of talk of um, our relations with others, which is obviously important, our relations with um, those who come before us and after us. Can you enlighten us on our own traditions mm. of self-reflection? Well, let's use meditation mm. as an example. As something we believe resides exclusively in the East. Mm. And is therefore not part of what people call African spirituality. Um, well, Africa is the cradle of humankind and therefore the cradle of human spirituality. What that means is that all seven billion or eight billion now of us are African. Now, I don't want to problematize the idea of being African uh, for now, because I have my own problems with being called African and calling this continent African, I mean Africa. Uh, I have my own problems that I don't want to go into. I also have my own problem with calling what we are talking about African spirituality. Mm -hmm. For me, there's only human spirituality. Um, and if you look at it, whether they're in the East or the North or the West, there are certain practices when we engage in spirituality which betray the reality that we have common ancestors whose origin is here, Africa. And therefore, we are tied spiritually mm -hmm. to those ancestors. Hence, so many things are common and similar when you practice spirituality. Things like burial rites, for instance. Mm -hmm. Go anywhere in the world. There's so much that is Mm. Now, when it comes to meditation, I find that in African spirituality, in what we call African spirituality, there are many devices that are used mm. for meditation. One of them is the drum. Mm. So the constant beat, the repetition mm. of the drum takes you into a meditative state. What I find, though, is that if 10 of us are here and someone is playing the drum or people are playing the drum, two things happen. Maybe more, but I want to isolate two. Firstly, as individuals, we go into a meditative state as we, as individuals, connect with certain spirits and forms of consciousness as individuals. The second thing that happens is that collectively we go into a meditative state, we become one as we connect to the same thing. But one of the devices that takes us there is the drum, dancing, singing, and so on. Mm. Mm. Dancing, singing, are some of the devices that take us into this meditative state. Some people will go into a trance. And the meditative state, whether it takes the form of a, a, a trance or another form, is important. Because think of it as a form of out-of-body experience. 
you look at our individual reality and collective reality from the outside of those realities. And when you go into that meditative state or a trance, you are given the opportunity to clarify certain things about your relationship with your individual, individual reality or a collective reality. <laughs> things like thought. Uh, things like re-examining re -examining what you already believe and venturing to explore new thoughts. And when you come back from that meditative state or from that trance, you may actually, if you're lucky, come back with ideas to share that may improve at least your part of the human condition. So these are practices that have been with us and our ancestors that are not exclusively the preserve of the East, mm. that have been with us for a very long time. There is a, a nation, so-called Native American nation, in North America, called the Blackfoot. One of the things they teach us is contained in one of their sayings. They say, look to the mountain. What do you see? So you start imagining the mountain. You imagine yourself having reached the summit. What do you see when you look down? You see many paths leading to the summit. In other words, when they say, look, to the mountain, they are alerting you to the fact that the path you took is one amongst many which led to the summit. Which means when we engage with issues of spirituality, that's one of the things you must remember. That that path of yours, your spiritual path, is one amongst many mm. that leads to the summit. When you look forward, you turn and you look forward. You look at the horizon. You are looking at possibility, many possibilities, a range of futures. And one of the things that may enable you to choose correctly is to look back at the different paths and learn from each path. Mm -hmm. Because these paths together may arm you when it comes to deciding on which of the many options that lie before you must you choose. Now, look to the mountain tells us something else. Um, this is an idea we draw, or I mean we, we borrow from Buddhism. Uh, I am influenced quite a lot personally by Buddhist ideas. Mm. The idea that nothing is distinguishable is very important to me. The idea that there is no I or you, no observer and observed. We are one. It's very important to me because that idea implicates many things. Things like our conception of gender. If we are truly one, there is no man there and a woman here. Mm. Or a woman there and a man here. A white person there and a black person here. A Muslim there and a Christian here. An African there and an American here because we, we are one. And the implications, one of the implications of that, if you and I are one, 
if I do something bad to you, I do something bad to myself. If I do something good to you, I do that to me. And that is why, borrowing from the Bible, the Bible says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I say the Bible doesn't go far enough. My own view is that you must love yourself. No, no I'm sorry. You must love your neighbor more than you love yourself. That's my idea. You must love your neighbor more than you love yourself. Imagine what kind of world it would be where all of us love the other more than we love ourselves. And rooted in that understanding is the idea that nothing is distinguishable. There is no observer and observed. There is no you. There is no me. There is no separation. We are one. The, the rubbish we see in the global economy with certain nations believing or a particular race believing that all that exists on this planet was created only for them would not be happening if we lived our lives in this manner. And so this may not sound political and it shouldn't sound political in this respect. There is no separation between that which is spiritual and economic. This principle must inform what we do in the economy. If we are one, we are not going to exploit. If we love others more than we love ourselves, we will not exploit them economically. We will not oppress them politically. Because to oppress them is to oppress myself. And therefore, as you see it in that 55th conference, that which you do which is bad to those of another faction, you do to yourself. And therefore you do it to the ANC. And, and the ANC, as part of humanity, must evolve to the stage of understanding human relations. On that end, on this theme of reflection and the link in some ways between the spiritual and the political, I've often wondered what role um, the process of incarceration or even the process of exile and mm. the underground movement mm. had in forcing people to, to go into internal states of self-reflection. Mm. And you mentioned Mandela, but of course there are many more, many different people from different schools of thought. And what we obviously didn't see was those moments of personal, of all those, my father was detained, I know you. In, in fact, we were in the same cell with really? your father, yes. Wow. Uh, the father, Paul Mashatile, Vusikanyile, um, Amos Masondo, we were in the same cell <laughs> at the beginning of the state of emergency in 1985. Wow. Yeah. That I did not know, and yeah. that makes a lot of sense now. One day I will tell you a story about a fun evening event <laughs> your father convinced me we must have. <laughs> the only reason I agreed, he said to me, comrade, you and I will be the judges, not performers. <laughs> <laughs> this I need to hear. This I need to hear. Um, so you, you would have seen that. You would have seen that more than I have seen that in my father and in others. Those moments where you have to, I'm, I'm presuming you would have had to go inside because mm. you were locked in or you were... Yes. And so maybe that's why initially some of the leaders we got had tapped into that. 
mm. to one degree or another. But as mm. democracy has unfolded more and more, we've lost um, that ability of introspection and self-realization. Mm. And to some extent, that's why we can't summon the, the leadership needed to take us mm. to that next level. Mm. To find, because we need, we need something dramatic and creative and ins inspiring, mm. almost sublime at this mm. point, to take us out of this malaise. You know, Ketla, this is coming to me now. I'm imagining that uh, cell mm. uh, in uh, Sun City. We were young. Mm. And people like me and your father, Paul Mashatile, and others, never had a life as young people mm. that was snuffed out mm. by our involvement in the liberation struggle. Mm. And we come out of that struggle to be confronted by many struggles, struggles of the mind and the soul. Mm. And I am called upon as a healer to be empath empathetic and compassionate. So my analysis may be critical, but I hope it is not hateful. Because I, I must be empathetic and compassionate. To the extent that I must condemn, I must condemn with understanding. An understanding that comes from an, an empathetic and compassionate place. Because I understand the struggles of the mind and the struggles of the soul some of us are going through. Mm. Um, we have, if we look at things that way, leaders who are afflicted by trauma. Mm. We, 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 we have leaders who have never spoken about the trauma they suffered during apartheid. Mm. We have leaders who are traumatized by their failure to deliver on the promise of a better life for all. Mm. Some are traumatized by that. Mm. We must not be fooled when some of them adopt an arrogant or defensive posture. It's just that, a defense mechanism. That response comes from a place of trauma and pain. Trauma and pain that were never treated, that continue not to be treated, that have become part of the pathologies that ail the South African condition or the human condition in South Africa. Going back to that cell, I think most of us did not go inside. Mm. At that time, to be an atheist, Marxist, Leninist, materialist was very attractive. Mm. We didn't go inside. Mm. And remember, this awakening we see today this relationship now we have with these laws. Mm. We didn't have it there. All we had was one another. And this is why, for instance, subjectively, mm. there are comrades, I, I will forgive anything. I mean, that's an exaggeration. Mm. Not anything, anything. Sure, sure. The late Jackson Tim, for instance, mm. Amos Masonde. I think if it was not for Amos Masonde, many of us who were of my age in that cell would not have survived detention. Mm. Somehow Amos Masonde had the strength to mentor us mm. and to help us cope with being in prison. At an age, in his absence, it would have been very difficult to cope with being in prison. Mm. And therefore, someone like that, and, I, and I'm saying, I'm not saying I'm right, 
in saying I'll forgive him anything. Sure, sure. You know, I say this from a place of gratitude that you had comrades mm. who were older than us, who in the absence of going inside to build a particular relationship with self that would make you cope with detention and prison, in the absence of that, you had comrades like Amos Masonda who helped us to cope, who helped our minds and spirits to cope better. And that is why people don't realize that on many occasions I hold back. I could be much more critical, mm -hmm. but I hold back because I remember. I remember who they were. I remember what they did for me. Mm. I remember what they did for us. But the reality, Shubi, is that for many of us, our spirits are hurting and in pain. Mm. Our minds are in pain. And that is why I look at some of the leaders and I think, what he's doing comes from a place of pain and trauma. And after 1994, we did nothing, absolutely nothing, with that pain and trauma, including the pain and trauma of those who came before us. Mm -hmm. And for me, therefore, spiritual interventions are important, but as I said, I am guided by this saying of the Blackfoot, look to the mountain. In other words, the help that we need for our spirit and our minds mm. will come from different places, religions, spiritual traditions, and so on. Mm. Mm. For me, what matters is that in the end, South Africa must start dealing with the pain and trauma. Even when I do angry critiques of whiteness, for instance, and racism, mm -hmm. there are times when I think of the child, the African child who died in the concentration camps of the English, the woman who watched her child dying in the concentration camps of the English. I do think of the mother who lost her son. And her son's only sin is that he was not a member of the UDF, he was a member of House Apple. I do think of her father who was killed because his son was a member of House Apple. And when my comrades went to his house looking for this son who's a member of House Apple, and do not find him. They kill his father instead. These are things which did happen to me. These are the traumas we carry. Mm. This is the pain we carry. And we have done nothing about this trauma and pain. Mm. And one of the things I believe very strongly at the moment is that people of faith and spirituality must do something about this. Otherwise, South Africa will not know peace because as individual South Africans, we do not know peace inside. Gogo, we'll leave it there for today. But uh, firstly, two things. Thank you very much for joining us again. I know Tobos. that you're, Tobos, I know that you're discerning about your time. So every time you join us, it's a gift. And I'll I'm good at pretending I'm discerning about my time. <laughs> Uh, also, on behalf of everyone watching, I wish you happy birthday. You Thank you very much. Recently celebrated your birthday, so my 60th. Your 60th yes. birthday. I didn't know whether to reveal or not. So no, no, no. You can, you can. You, I have no problem with it. Yeah. Another thing I can reveal is that I'm grateful that I reached 60. There's a Friday in August, lying in hospital. I didn't think I was going to come out of, out of that hospital alive. Mm. So I'm grateful that I reached this milestone. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, something I was aware of. 
and so your presence is even more valued. Tawazako. Tawazako. Happy birthday. Thank you. Aye, aye.